My name is uh, Dr. Marissa Nadelson Love. I am a neurologist. I'm actually a cognitive and behavioral neurologist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Today I'm going to talk about how to assess somebody with initial cognitive complaints uh, before you have achieved a diagnosis. So I'm going to start with the case. This is the patient. Mr. F is a 73-year-old man who is a retired high school track coach with a history of obstructive sleep apnea for which he wears his CPAP um, and hearing loss for which he does wear his hearing aids but still has some deficits. He's still independent and drives, but he has made some inattentive errors that led to fender benders of the, that were concerning. His wife says he's become more forgetful and frustrates more easily over the past year. And his father and two of his father's siblings had dementia, which really prompted uh, his complaints. So the Alzheimer's Association has screening recommendations about who should be evaluated for cognitive impairment. So someone like our patient with memory complaints, someone who has other complaints that are not necessarily do memory domain, but um, changes in personality, uh, symptoms concerning for depression, um, unexplained worsening of disease control, um, where they had been perhaps good at controlling things like diabetes and hypertension, um, you know, it may warrant further evaluation if that changes or if they've started to have frequent falls. Um, there's also the individuals who their informant, whether that be family or friend, reports cognitive changes. And actually the Medicare um, annual wellness visit um, requires that you do some sort of cognitive screener uh, for somebody that is a Medicare beneficiary. So here are some recommended assessments. The Alzheimer's Association particularly recommends that have um, some data to back up uh, that they're effective. They are less than five minutes. Um, uh, I know time can be a, a big constraint in a primary care setting. Um, something called the mini cog, which is less than five minutes, is just giving three items for someone to repeat and remember and then draw a clock and then recall those three items. Um, and they get a point for each of the items that they remember, as well as a point for, I think, putting the hands, I'm sorry, yeah, the hands and the numbers on the clock. So it's a total of five. So if somebody makes less than a four, then that suggests they need evaluation. There's an assessment called the General Practitioner Assessment of Cognition. The first one involves some questions for the uh, participant, the person that um, has some cognitive complaints. And then if that's abnormal, it suggests that you also need to do part two and get the informant's information. And that's the, the cutoff for um, who needs further evaluation. The AD8 um, is um, the eight item interview to differentiate aging and dementia. Um, and it is something that you just hand to an informant. So it can be done, you know, without taking a lot of time in clinic and um, has a cutoff of less than five um, to further uh, evaluate. And then the final one here is the short form of, of the informant questionnaire on cognitive decline in the elderly, elderly which we always call the IQ code. Um, the short IQ code is 16 questions, and it's kind of like a Likert scale where um, you can say whether or not, you know, some, they're doing something you know, worse than before or not. Um, and so anybody that if you average all 16 questions makes greater than this 3.38 needs for their evaluation. Um, and these are really short assessments. Um, you know, if you do have cognitive impairment and, and want to assess it further, there are longer assessments that um, that people will typically do. And that's when you get into things like the mini mental state exam or the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It is required by the American Academy of Neurology that you rule out depression in people with um, cognitive or um, other memory complaints. Um, there are some standardized assessments that are short, 
Um, the geriatric depression scale is very uh, widely known and a score of greater than or equal to five suggests depression. The um, patient health questionnaire or PHQ-2 is just a two question um, questionnaire and uh, a score of three or greater suggests depression. Um, PHQ-9 is the nine question version of that, which is, gets into more details about symptoms. So they have an abnormal screener. You've done you know, your cognitive assessment and it suggests further evaluation. The next steps um, include some blood work. Um, these have traditionally been called the reversible labs, but I put that in quotes mm -hmm. because um, they're not exactly completely reversible. If somebody has damage to nerves in the brain, those nerves do not ever regenerate. Um, so they are not something, you know, but if you do correct a problem, you can actually prevent further progression. So those, that's where it gets the reversible is that, um, compared to something that is a progressively worsening disease, um, you can, you can turn things around with these. So the American Academy of Neurology suggestions for or recommendations for getting labs include electrolytes, glucose, kidney function, liver function. I typically order uh, a CMP or a complete uh, uh, metabolic panel. The CBC, um, getting blood counts, um, thyroid function, and they suggest vitamin B12. There's um, evidence that a low vitamin D can also lead to more rapid progression of cognitive decline. So that's become standard of care, even though it's not included in those um, uh, guidelines. If there's a risk factor, like poor nutrition for any reason, not just someone who drinks alcohol, a thiamine level should be included and um, any risk factor um, for um, sexually uh, transmitted infections, um, the person should get the RPR. So other contributors that need to be addressed in somebody that's having um, personality, memory, or other cognitive changes, um, mood, and we discussed depression, but other things like anxiety and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder can really lead to some cognitive changes. Um, drugs and alcohol, so not just illicit drugs, but prescribed drugs that are sedating or anticholinergic, and those can be found on the beers list, um, can really impact people's cognitive performance. Pain, and a lot of people don't really realize that subconsciously their brain is always processing pain, so it can be something that detracts from their ability to process other information. Um, because even though they are not necessarily in extremes, the pain is is impacting their cognitive abilities. Everybody gets screened for sleep apnea, um, as that is a common disorder that can lead to some cognitive changes and irritability, as well as other um, important you know, vascular risk factors, as well as other sleep disorders like insomnia, restless legs. Um, epilepsy certainly could be a contributor. Um, drugs that treat epilepsy certainly do cause cognitive impairment as well as the actual um, seizures. Any other organ failure, the ones that come to mind, um, heart failure has been associated with cognitive decline, which you can call, you know, the other type of vascular cognitive impairment, um, even if the MRI doesn't show any lesions. Um, liver impairment and kidneys because of the buildup of toxic metabolic waste. Structural lesions, which you, of course, will only be able to see if you do get some kind of um, neuroimaging, would be normal pressure hydrocephalus or a subdural hematoma. Um, and, um, you know, depending on the situation, you may want to get an MRI, as that's going to give us more information about all of the factors that may contribute to cognitive impairment. But uh, in some situations, a CT scan may suffice to diagnose these two structural lesions. So back to our patient. So he had an abnormal cognitive screener. Um, and at the conclusion of his initial visit, 
um, we discussed that he actually has contributions from some chronic osteoarthritis pain um, that leads to problems with falling asleep at the beginning of the night, um, as well as his profound hearing loss, even though he has his hearing aids. Um, a lot of his uh, errors perhaps would have been uh, caught if he was able to hear things like turning the stove off um, or making sure the car's all the way off when he gets out of it. So an MRI brain was ordered to evaluate for any pathology, especially considering his history and his family. So we're, I'm going to talk about the barriers to assessment um, that come from the patient side. So people may not present um, for evaluation for a number of reasons. Um, there's different cultural approaches to aging um, in different groups. Um, some groups, you know, expect some decline um, and really think of that as part of normal aging. Sometimes this relates to their um, their home structure, their social structure, you know, if, if people um, age in a multi-generational home, you know, this may not be necessarily a problem because we know that person is safe because they have supervision from other family members. Whereas there are, you know, um, most of the culture in the United States um, values independence um, into aging. And so that can lead to safety concerns and that might bring those people to um, the medical attention sooner. There is distrust of the medical system, and some of it is, you know, based on some racial and ethnic bias about the medical system and how, you know, they assess people um, for cognitive complaints, um, as well as some, you know, history of, you know, um, unethical activity in the past, um, especially related to um, things that are undergoing research um, there's lack of knowledge of the available treatments. I get a lot of, you know, so there's nothing you can do about that, right? Um, and there are a lot of things that we can do, whether they're pharmacological or um, behavioral interventions that, that can be helpful. A lot of people don't have a specialist in the area, um, and that can be, um, you know, a reason that they they don't actually pursue it because they don't have an idea about where to go for the problem. There's financial reasons that can be, you know, lack of transportation to medical care, can be lack of insurance coverage, um, could be, um, you know, any number of other things related to finances that limit people uh, presenting, as well as language barriers. Um, you know, there's a lack of people that speak the same language as um, a lot of people in the United States, and that might mean they do not present uh, because of uh, thought that they don't really, they're not going to get a good evaluation. There's also provider-based barriers, a big one in, in primary care and anybody out in private practice, I'm lucky enough to be in academics, is time. Um, very limited time with the patient um, and opening this topic can be like opening a can of worms. So, um, so creating ways that can streamline that would be really helpful. Lack of a collateral informant coming to the clinic visit um, can really limit you. And, you know, especially somebody who's socially appropriate, you may not really know how impaired they are. Um, there are, as I mentioned before, racial and socioeconomic biases about, um, you know, what somebody, you know, with those backgrounds may be able to do and therefore you may not pick up on declines. Um, there's aging biases, again, just like you know, I get a lot of people asking me, don't I just have old timers, not Alzheimer's? Um, so some people think uh, they expect to have these problems as they get older, and that can happen with the providers as well. Um, the providers may not have access to specialists to um, to refer people to, and that might I mean they sort of think there's not a whole lot they can do to help people. And of course, fighting with insurance to cover you know any treatments that we have. So one of the most important things that I talk about with my patients and I think is critical for everybody to be talking about um, is that lifestyle is the best medicine for your brain. Um, the thing that has the most evidence is getting moderate intensity exercise. So 150 minutes a week um, of anything that gets your heart rate up um, from 100 to 160 
is the goal. And that can help improve a lot of the changes that happen even with normal aging. Um, but it actually prevents brain size from getting smaller, um, as well as can maintain independence in other ways. Um, as you know, uh, exercise is critical for all parts of the body. And so um, what's good for the body is good for the brain. The mind diet is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, which is the hypertension diet. Um, and that involves, um, you know, eating fish twice a week. Um, that's rich in omega-3 fatty acids, eating brightly colored fruits and vegetables every single day, um, making sure your grains are whole grains rather than processed grains, um, and eating the healthy oils like um, olive oil um, that have uh, the good um, fatty acids in them. And then cognitively stimulating activities, it can be kind of controversial. There's no really one that's the best for maintaining brain health. Um, I recommend socialization because it is um, often a mood booster. It's something that gets you up and moving as well when you're interacting with other people. Um, and building social networks has been shown to um, keep people more independent for longer and out of the hospital. So um, I think social activity, and that was really um, brought to a head over the pandemic where a lot of people didn't have access to those activities. And then there was a big decline in, in people's function uh, related to that. So um, I typically recommend socializing, but anything that somebody enjoys doing, I mean, they can do crossword puzzles all day if they enjoy it, but if it's going to stress them out, then um, I don't recommend that stress cortisol actually counteracts the benefits of the cognitive activity. So um, I recommend people getting involved in something that they like to do in order to challenge themselves every day. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And I really hope this was helpful.